how do we change behavior from being reactive to proactive? Nobody cares about therapists. Unless, of course, you get injured. Then therapists are the most important people on the planet. Just in case you're not able to make my presentation at Therapy Expo, um, I've done a screencast-o-matic for you. So I'll be presenting on whether the functional movement screen can be used to predict injury in extreme training programs. So my name is Dale Walker and uh, I'll be taking you through this presentation. So the presentation is going to consist of why you should listen to me, a little bit of background, what are extreme training programs, what's the problem, my history with FMS, what is functional movement screening, the literature, the evidence, my research and some take home messages. So a little bit about me, I'm the co-founder of a company called Bulletproof Bodies and we deal with extreme sports and extreme training programs and we do the re rehabilitation for that. I'm a university lecturer at the University of Salford in Manchester specialising in exercise prescription. I've been working with extreme and CrossFit athletes uh, since I was in Afghanistan in 2010. Uh, I've worked for CrossFit since 2013. I'm research active, I'm an ex-army physiotherapist now serving with the reserves. I'm an ex-Royal Marine and ex-army physical trainer instructor and I only work with tactical and extreme athletes. So what are extreme training programs? Well they're multifaceted circuit training basically and they're fitness programs using a variety of resistance training uh, and challenging running intervals with repeated bouts of body weight or resisted or, or plyometric exercises. Uh, they consist of a high volume of aggressive training workouts that use a variety of high intensity exercises, often timed for maximal number of reps with a short rest in between sets. They are extreme and they are hard. So they're things like CrossFit, Insanity, Metafit, Tabata, boot camps, and they've all gained popularity over the last decade. Uh, and they consist of what we call high intensity functional training, HIFT. Uh, and there's an association between extreme training programs and mild or acute soft tissue injury. If you saw my presentation at Therapy Expo last year, I presented on that. Um, but can we predict who's most likely to get injured? Well, it's part of a paradigm shift in healthcare from reactive to proactive. And pre-participation screening uh, is really common in sports medicine and there's no strong evidence for it. Um, we believe there's a wealth of information that can be acquired by just observing the way people move and perform functional tasks. We know that injury prevention has some good evidence uh, from the FIFA 11 Plus and all the research behind that. I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but can we predict injury? So first things first, uh, extreme training programs are not sport. Uh, therefore, we should be able to control the controllable factors. And if we can, then why are people getting injured? And do we need some sort of preventative training before we partake in extreme training programs? So here's the Van Mecklian model of injury prevention. First of all, um, we've got to measure the problem. Then we've got to come up with why it's happening, develop a strategy, uh, combine some randomized control trials and some good research, describe how the intervention affected it, and then implement into real, the real world effectiveness. We want to ask two questions. Why do injuries happen? And the second is, can we predict who's at risk of injury? And that's what we'll be presenting on today. So beginners to high intensity functional training are at risk of musculoskeletal injury as they lack the movement skill and the conditioning required to participate in this. Uh, there's also kind of one size fits all group um, mentality. That's the way that you have to run stuff. Uh, and there's a con there's a, a tendency to, to want to overtrain uh, and of course under recover. So although the generally generally these issues are, are mild and acute, um, could they be prevented by a movement screen? So are we as therapists the movement police? Um, and does moving well stop us getting injured? Uh, for instance, can this individual maintain good form at speed, under load, or when fatigued? So a movement evaluations, as I said, are being implemented across the world. Uh, and in sport, uh, they're not great at predicting injury. But 
extreme training programs are potentially controllable uh, and we appreciate that some assumptions are going to be made when we visually observe uh, a client uh, and this may be inaccurate or misleading so as we said before um, we believe that highlighting risk factors is the important thing um, and we want to try and make the invisible visible and demonstrate either a, a lack of mobility they are unable to make the right shape or a lack of motor control um, we're trying to spot asymmetries and reduce range of movement and any compensation strategies. So I'm hopefully going to present a balanced view of the literature and my research. Remember that not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So here is the multifactorial reasons we, we get injured from um, uh, Lee Harrington's book Performance Assessment in Strength and Conditioning. Um, so we've got if we begin with the non-modifiable age, gender, current training status where they are and previous injury. Um, we've got environmental factors, hot and cold. We've got additional demands. We'll come on to that later. What stage of conditioning are they at? We've always got other factors, motor control, training related, too much volume, okay, psychological constituents and of course health. So these are multifactorial stuff. So extreme training programs, what are they? They are all the rage. So Insanity, CrossFit, P90X, Metafit, Tabata, Jim Jones, boot camps, the list goes on. And the previous generation, their thoughts about exercise was everything in moderation. Uh, and this generation's more go big or go home. Uh, and I want it now, that instant gratification. Uh, in a world where many people are feeling a loss of control, um, high effort, uh, intense workouts makes people feel empowered so that's why they're definitely on the rise there so we know that extreme training programs are very popular for those having a midlife crisis uh, and uh, a study by Hoffman and Fogard found that uh, in ultra distance running the average age was 44 so it's very much a middle age thing uh, as athleticism in the extreme is the new midlife crisis so what's being said about extreme exercise? Well, some people are saying it's a form of functional self-punishment uh, and you're able to alleviate your guilt from some other part of your life. Uh, others say that it's rebalancing the scales of justice. Um, however, I think there's a trend of people who fashion their daily life and work and relationships completely around these extreme training programs. Uh, and some of them persist despite injury. OK, and that's not good. So if we have a look at when I first started getting into this. Um, so this is from 2013 uh, and it's the ACSM stance uh, answering to extreme training programs, things like CrossFit. Um, so I became interested when the US military had concerns. Um, they noticed a high musculoskeletal injury rate for novice participants. Uh, that injury rate is highly costly to the military and it was going against kind of military doctrine for physical training which had been quite strict before. Uh, and the need to improve exercise prescription and implementation was highlighted um, but the need to reduce injury was more. So Social media has a huge influence. Uh, you have the inexperienced Instagram coach, the newbie uh, contestant preparation coach, people doing cross shit, um, which is doing CrossFit badly and then posting on social media. Uh, and then, of course, all these fitness challenges that are demanding and dangerous feats of athleticism. Uh, these are basically just people showing off. So I identified four categories last year of extreme training participant. Your beginner, that's when they've been doing it less than a year, your recreational um, participant, they've been doing that over a year, and then people that begin to compete, um, and those that are new to competition, so they're stepping up to the next level, and then finally the, the elites who are talented and robust, and we generally don't need to worry about them. So extreme training programs, um, there was a study uh, by these guys and what they're what they're saying really is if we look at what's going on the upper arm or the shoulder uh, and the spine are the two things that consistently um, get injured from these particular activities uh, and that was backed up by my data that I'm going to be showing you a little bit later um, so if we look at the literature this is from CrossFit um, so shoulder and 
um, back of the uh, the two main concerns that we're that we're looking at. The knee also gets a mention, uh, but remember most of these injuries are acute and mild and very treatable by by therapists. Um, so you can see the shoulder and and the back uh, massively represented in this particular study. And then we've got an amalgamation of studies, some of the decent ones about CrossFit, showing you um, that shoulder injuries and back injuries are, are the main things that we're concerned about. Um, so in order for a screening test to be validated, we need to have a strong relationship between the, the test uh, and injury risk. Uh, the test also needs to be examined in the relevant population um, and we need to identify that those at high risk of injury um, need some sort of corrective program in order to stop them getting injured. So the functional movement screen, um, when we started doing injury prevention it was all about small data like quad strength or um, single leg hop or single leg squat, um, we weren't really measuring patterns of movement in the same way. So the functional movement screen uh, started measuring movement. Uh, and why do we screen movement? We screen movement simply to make the invisible visible. So what is the functional movement screen? Um, it's a baseline measurement concept created in 1997, uh, so it's now over 20 years old, where you're going to be assessed on seven fundamental tests. Um, and they're going to screen you for functional limitations, asymmetries, lack of range of movement. Uh, and there's some corrective exercises around that. Um, so subjects can be retested to show an improvement. So each score is between 0 and, and 3 for each test. So you've got maximum score of 21. So these are the tests. Overhead squat, uh, hurdle step, inline lunge, shoulder mobility, active straight leg raise, trunk stability push-up, and rotatory stability. So my experience with CrossFit, I've been using it since 2009, where um, I saw Gray Cook give a lecture in Edinburgh. I've been in-house training with it, uh, with Special Forces, uh, and then I became instructor in 2012. Um, I started doing some research with CrossFit athletes. Uh, I trained the Gurkhas in Brunei. I work with Army Reservists and CrossFit athletes, and I've still got some ongoing things uh, with that. So the scoring system... Here you can see you've got the, the tests, you get a raw score and a final score, and then you get a chance to write some comments. But if you've got an asymmetry, okay, so for instance, you score one on one side and two on the other, or two on one side and three on the other, okay, you always go with the lowest score. So that highlights an asymmetry. And any dysfunction, this represents poor movement. And of course, if you get pained, then you get zero. We've got three clearing tests here. This is a self impingement test. This is global spinal flexion and global spinal extension. Again, you score zero if you get any pain on those movements. So what we're looking for, a three is optimal movement. Two, there's some compensation or imperfection with the movement. One, they're unable to perform the movement pattern. And two, they get pain during that movement pattern. So what's the cut score? Because this is the important thing. So if you score two on each test, you get 14. So 14 would be considered low risk of injury. Um, that's the key, 14 or above. But you've got to make sure you get two on each of them. It's no good acing a couple of them and, and highlighting uh, the, the fact that you've got a one or a zero on another because that put, the pain puts you at risk. Um, pain puts you at that high risk of injury specific. So if, if it's shoulder mobility, um, then that's what you're going to be at risk of. And a score of 13 or below puts you at that high risk. There's a hierarchy of the movement. So here we've got active straight leg raise and shoulder mobility. These are flexibility or mobility tests. Uh, rotatory stability, trunk stability, push-up. These are stability tests. Inline lunge, hurdle step, and the overhead squat. This is asymmetrical stance, this is symmetrical stance, and this is single leg stance. So we start the research by O'Connor's study looking at um, USMC, United States Marine Corps Officer Cadets, uh, and they had a look, at, it was a massive study screening all these officer cadets and initially showed some promise because those that scored over 14 were more likely to pass so we could invest it, the US uh, Marine Corps could invest in them heavily, and those that got less than 14 were twice as likely to drop out 
get injured or not continue the program. So this was a big deal.